Thank you so much for coming out and having your breakfast with me. <laughs> it's awesome. Uh, thank you so much to Creative Mornings Dublin for inviting me along. That's a photograph of me when I'm 19. So <laughs> this, is, this is hilarious. It's like the past coming beside me. Um, thank, uh, yeah, thanks very much to Creative Morning Dublin and to Brian for inviting me along to speak to you guys. And the theme this month is broken. So I'm going to be talking about something very important that's broken that will become apparent during the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to open my talk with a quote from a woman called Leslie Jameson who wrote a book called The Empathy Exams. Empathy comes from the Greek empathia, M into, and pathos, feeling, a penetration, a kind of travel. It suggests you enter another person's pain as you'd enter a country, through immigration and customs, borders crossing by way of query. What grows where you are? What are the laws? What animals graze there? My name is Sarah Griffin. Um, I'm a writer. It always takes a solid deep breath before uh, every time I say that to get it out and not say I'm a nanny, because um, I was a nanny for three years. Um, and it's much easier to explain to people what that is than the other. I write books for a living. Um, my first book, Not Lost, was a non-fiction text about living in America, written diary style uh, as my immigration happened around me. My first novel, Spare and Found Parts, is about, it's out in October. It's about a girl who builds herself a robotic friend. Think Wally meets Frankenstein meets Children of Men. Um, I'm currently working on my second novel, uh, which is will be handing it into my editor this winter. And in the long, quiet days of battling with the blank page and trying not to watch too many makeup tutorials on YouTube, I hang around on Twitter. Um, I work by day in a shared space most of the week lately, but before, while I was looking after small children and writing at night, I didn't really have co-workers. Uh, so the internet, primarily Twitter, became like my water cooler. It was my canteen. It was this room, but in my phone and on my browser. Uh, it was where I went to talk to other people about my day, given that six months olds don't really care where you're at at a rewatch with the X-Files or how good you've just gotten at Mario Kart. They really don't care. They don't speak generally, kind of little noises. Um, so I am thrilled to be here and have been asked to have a chat with you. Uh, I'm here not to talk about myself or my job. I'm here to talk about you and the internet and the intersection of those two things. The place that you, as a feeling, breathing human, meet the digital landscape, the scrolling, endless library of other people's experience. The thing that is broken, we will get to. Is it okay if I read you some tweets? Is that weird? <laughs> to get up here at half eight in the morning and be like, hey, can I read you some 140 character snippets? Look. These tweets are pretty much why I ended up here in the first place, so I think it's important that I'll share them with you. Uh, I will in a, bit, in a, in a moment. Um, there's been a cold line. I guess this morning is strangely poignant as well. I feel like every time I look down at my phone, I'm going to find out some new horrific detail about Brexit. Um, so this, this is, it counts for this morning as well. There's been a cold line of terror in the news the last few weeks. All of your timelines have shown you details of the, or the atro atrocity in Orlando, uh, the murder of Joe Cox, likely to the victim's statement from the Stanford rape case. On June 4th, Adweek reported that over 8.1 million people viewed this article. I'm sure that some of those 8.1 million people are in the room this morning. Yeah? yeah. Um, to quantify shares of an individual's trauma, frankly, is kind of gross, but the internet is still the Wild West, the final frontier of information and experience. Clicks and shares are the only metrics we have and in many ways become a currency of disaster and a currency of pain. In the wake of the letter the Stanford survivor wrote, I noticed, like white foam on waves, think pieces popping up about the survivor and the perpetrator, Brock Turner. This is what happens. Folk respond with outrage, with call to action, with condemnation. Extended status updates, medium.com pieces, razor sharp Tumblr posts, news outlets publish them and the conversation expands, a whirlpool, and then it dissipates and passes when the next tragedy hits, the water is stirred up elsewhere. I'm a writer, that's my job. And it's a strange job, and a job I'm very fortunate to have. And when I'm not writing, I read. And I probably read a lot more think pieces than I probably should. I probably read more think pieces than poems or books. Uh, 
here in the cold water I am seeing the same gang of mermaids singing as I always do. All of the think pieces, the hot takes, they spawn from the same clued in, copped on, distinctly female writers that they always have. The online conversation about sexual violence is staying within a com community of women writers. And while that offers a sense of support and validation, it's an echo chamber. So I'm not going to be on this subject for long. I'm going to read you guys some tweets, and then we're going to go way back into empathy and see where that intersects here. So I'm going to read you some tweets. There's some, there's some cussing. <laughs> so if it's a little early in the morning for cussing, I'm not sorry. <laughs> We tell each other, uh, so the, 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 I storified these tweets um, and uh, they were trending in, the storify was trending in Ireland um, on the day that they were made for a couple hours, which was real scary, <laughs> but turned out okay. Uh, and the name of the storify was Ambient Fear, Feminism and Bruce Banner. Uh, we tell each other horror stories over the campfire of feminism. We hold each other, nothing changes, the night is still very dark. Here's something about the Stanford rapist. Men like him aren't reading think pieces on sexual violence. They're continuing. I'm grateful to the community of feminist writers, but we're just talking to each other. Talking to men is harder. It's the hardest. We are in an echo chamber where it feels like the world is changing. But it isn't. The bros don't care. They'll get away for free. I'm comforted by knowing that other women see my experiences as a female body that lives in a public space, but it's not enough anymore. This whole thing is exhausting. I'm tired of knowing that more men will get away with violence because they're, like, good at a sport. How weird. These are conversations I will have, quiet, rage, and sorrow, with my daughters. Nothing will change. Women will protect each other. The problem is that rape is not just committed by individuals. It's systemic. Culture tells men they can get away with it. It shows them. Feminism is still considered a subculture, a radical notion, Patriarchy, however, is systemic. We are a shoal of sharp-toothed teeth, sharp-toothed fish in an ocean. My feminism is agnostic. Uh, I live by it. It's the lens that informs all of my vision. But I'm not kidding myself. I know what it's like it's outside. Another campus rape, another ripple of horror on social media, another few women read, feel comforted. Weeks pass, it's quiet, it happens again. Where are the think pieces by male writers? on rape culture. You think you're so good at building things. How about dismantling things for a change? This can't just be women talking to one another about pain and survival. More girls will be hurt. More lives are ruined. Step up, boys. One, only one of my male writer friends writes about the toxicity of masculinity and I respect the fuck out of him. Where are the rest of you? You'll whisper about how you're not one of these lads, the lot of you tail between your legs. Write something. And all of us women writing our experiences and lives are so brave and so honest. We're just trying to survive. The letter the Stanford rape survivor wrote is the same story girlfriends have whis whispered to me over pints again and again like a dark spell. Women tell one another the stories of their rapes and assaults all the time. We see one another. We have to. None of this is shocking anymore. If you're shocked even a little, you're sleeping on something so real to the rest of us that it keeps us up at night. Look at the culture you are raised in and how it continues to damage and harm folks. Use your influence for good. If you're sickened, imagine how we feel, whispering stories of assaults old and new over our breakfasts, numbed out, exhausted. I'm tired of culture asking women to be brave and share their trauma story in order to be validated. Where are the male writers? <sighs> it's always going to happen. So the stream of tweets is quite long and continues, but there's something very important that I'm going to get to here. Um, I'm not trying to convert anyone to feminism. Like, I'm not. I just see you. I see you clearly, and therefore how you see me and other women. I try very hard to take the edge off and be palatable, trust that I am the angriest person you know. I am the Bruce fucking banner of feminism. You already know, if you're a woman, what life in my body is like. You know the terror and rage. You know how to make yourself smaller. I'm tired of the echo chamber. I love you, but we're only talking to one another. This thing still happens every day. New assaults. Men don't care. Some men don't care. <laughs> Here's the thing. 
oh, I know that men, many men in my, not many men, but I know men in my social circle have committed or borne witness to acts of sexual violence, and there's nothing I can do about it. Here's the thing, so do you. You know these lads too, probably, if you're a lad, you know, you know them better than me. These lads won't listen to me. I'm a pretty chill, moderate, private feminist, but I'm still too much in this. They might listen to you, though, boys. Um, here's the thing I started with. I know these bros aren't on my timeline. <laughs> I'm a slipstream writer. I know they can't hear me, but I see them. This talking and tweeting me meets no good end. I know what tomorrow looks like. It looks just like today and yesterday. When the thunder and flash passes, it's just rain. It's the same as it ever was. We're all just trying to get by. I'm just tired of having to walk the hard line of pointing out that nothing is actually changing. Just because you're woke doesn't mean you're not still in bed. Get the fuck up. So there's more of that if you would like to have a look at it later, but I think I should probably get back to empathy and away from grimness. I'm aware this is, <laughs> this is bright and early for some real talk. Charlie Brooker and his lineup for, chan uh, for Channel 4 of how video games changed the world. Out of 25 games that changed the landscape we live in, named Twitter number one. Think of Twitter as a great big video game where we win by having good, relatable thoughts. Where we win by having powerful thoughts, funny thoughts, relevant thoughts, and condensing them into 140 characters of communication. The day I tweeted those things, I, I got a couple of levels up in the game. That felt nice. Nobody even came out of the woodwork to tell me that I'm a feminazi, or that not all men are this way. Actually, that's a lie. <laughs> a few people did come out of the woodwork to tell me not all men are this way. That's fine. Um, that's absolutely fine. I get that. Uh, I mean, I don't like it when those things happen, but I still get it. I'd like here to examine the impulse to deny one's own privilege in online spaces. I'd like to say, hey, maybe the soapbox is broken. As I mentioned in those tweets, I don't often use the internet to talk about my opinions uh, publicly. I use Twitter to listen. Imagine having this whole library of other people's experiences, emotions, thoughts to browse and using it as just a soapbox instead, at worst, at a, as a fight club. I mean, I use it to post pictures of my cat and inquire about the best places to buy unusual chocolate spread. But aside from that, pretty chill. Pictures of good dogs are okay too. I'm not talking here about never talking. I'm just talking about listening more. When you're in a library, or like a real library, like the ones with books, you're actually not really allowed to talk at all. That's kind of the thing, isn't it? The shh librarians. You have to sit there and be quiet and read, and hopefully while reading, something will change for you. Isn't this what all learning does? Shift something in reality, gives you insight that maybe before wasn't possible. I think a lot about, I'll get back to that. Uh, so when I was a teenager and really, really bad at Irish, like so, ba like so bad, so bad that it was like, you're going to fail or leave and search. It's over. Uh, I took grinds uh, and tutoring from this softly spoken woman in Clontarf who was an accountant by day and by night gave free grinds to the linguistically challenged like myself. Um, I struggled still and I don't remember a lot. Uh, but one thing strikes out in my memory, one translation, the word for ladybird. Does anyone know what the word for ladybird in Irish is? This is oh, I love telling people this. <laughs> ladybird in Irish is Bowen Day, B O Father, I Father N, which at the root of the word means little cow of God. <laughs> I, s I swear this is true. Uh, Every time I see a ladybird, I think, tiny cow. <laughs> and that is savage. That made my life better. That actually made my life better. Uh, and that seems reductive in the grand scope of things. <laughs> um, that seems tiny. Uh, but the world absolutely felt a little different after learning that. So I lived in America for three years, that was mad. Um, while living there, I found myself faced with all sorts of cultural things that I didn't understand how to navigate. And I'm not talking like failing Irish in the Leaving Cert, I'm talking I have just moved to a country that I do not understand. I am learning very quickly that this is not the place I thought it was going to be. Uh, I didn't understand how to navigate the culture as a gal from an island with a very insular culture. 
uh, primarily white culture. At that, I was shocked that in the artistic circles I moved in at my own obvious, <laughs> oblivious and naive whiteness at how my friends, folks of colour and queer folk were treated by people who looked just like me. How I slipped up and said shitty, stupid things, asked glaringly insensitive questions. I had absolutely no idea how to cope, so I read. James Baldwin wrote, You think your pain and your heartbreak are unprecedented in the history of the world, but then you read. It was books that taught me that the things that torment me most were the very things that connected me with all the people who were alive or who have ever been alive. We read constantly on the internet. The internet has made obsessive readers of us all. Folks who would never pick up a book will pick up their phone or will log in. We, we read the ongoing diaries of people around us all day, every day, news sources, tweets, Facebook updates. We are bigger readers than we ever were. And just because we're not necessarily holding a book with a spine doesn't mean that we're not reading. So with no idea where to start, other than the heavy and inaccessible textbooks from my cultural studies degree, details mostly forgotten by then, I have never been a good student, I turned to the internet. I turned to Tumblr. I followed people who had different backgrounds to me. I listened quietly to their experience on my daily scrolls through feeds and feeds and feeds, and there I could be a silent listener. I could lurk, but lurk well. I fed myself. Sometimes the information I was met with hurt, being shown my own privilege as a white gal obviously didn't feel very good. Here's the thing, learning about systems of oppression isn't meant to feel good. It's just meant to feel. We're meant to internalize the effects of these systems of power on other people and we're meant to feel. And then on the back of that feeling we can change and make change. That's kind of the point. Here's the other thing. You don't have to go far to find new information about other people's life experiences. You just have to skip a few hashtags to the left of what you normally might read. You can watch entire thought streams and lives unfold. Maybe instead of outrage, elect empathy. There's an odd intimacy to social media. It's very easy to feel like folks are speaking directly to you. That's how people become celebrities in that world that placebo closeness, that relatability. When people of colour are speaking about their experiences of racism, maybe don't slide into their mentions and inform them that you are a good white person. Maybe just listen and then go out and try and be a better person. When women are talking about the microaggressions that make up the experience of living in a female presenting body, maybe don't wriggle in and tell them that not all men are rapists and that they need to stop being so angry all the time. Maybe listen. Maybe shift the environments you inhabit to make them more feminist. Take the place you hold in culture and change it for the better, rather than confronting folk who have built online communities of support with your outrage. Those who have a great deal of systemic power, white dudes, may not recognize the individual power that they have. Not every white dude is Bill Gates or Channing Tatum, and the great storytelling machine of the media probably tells you you should be or could be, but you aren't, and I get that that's disillusioning. I'm not like Scarlett Johansson myself or anything. The patriarchy is a sly dog, a good liar. Masculinity is fragile, a glass gun. But there's a great deal of power that manifests for you in microscopic ways that you can do good with or bad with. You hold the biggest space. What do you choose to do with it? This is what my tweets from earlier were about. They weren't about staying silent, actually. They were about listening and reading. If you're going to lurk, lurk well. If you're going to use your voice, use it well. Use the internet to learn rather than shout others down. Disassemble rather than reinforce. Use what you learn to adjust the, re the reality that you live in day to day. This doesn't have to be broken. Be considered Maybe try and feel a little what folks who are different to you are feeling and use that, use that to inform the choices you make in the real world, every day, even the small ones. When you see a tweet about white folk or the patriarchy, instead of getting defensive, consider the experiences of the people who are talking. Consider scenarios in real life where you may have been involved in some capacity with situations similar. Consider next time being different. Maybe you will find gold in the Wild West. Yes. 
I'm going to leave you this morning on another quote by Leslie Jemison. If you buy any book this month, buy and read the Empathy Exams. It's astonishing. Empathy isn't just something that happens to us. A meteor shower of synapses firing across the brain. It's also a choice we make to pay attention, to extend ourselves. It's made of exertion, that dowdier cousin of impulse. Sometimes we care for another because we know we should or because it's asked for, but this doesn't make our caring hollow. This confession of effort chafes against the notion that empathy should always rise unbidden, that genuine means the same thing as unwilled, that intentionality is the enemy of love. But I believe in intention and I believe in work. I believe in waking up in the middle of the night and packing our bags and leaving our worst selves for better ones. Thank you. <laughs>